let's talk about the purpose of crankcase bearings. And we want to say specifically crankcase bearings instead of engine bearings for a couple of reasons. First of all, let's look, you know, in the crankcase, you've obviously got the crankshaft bearing, the big end bearing, the little end bearing, but within an engine, there's also a couple of other bearings. So as an example, the camshaft. Um, the camshaft, generally, it's a, it's a plain bearing, but it's a slightly different environment to the crankshaft, right? So we're talking about a slightly different uh, lubricating environment. The other thing is that there are other bearings. So bearing, the definition of bearing is really just um, kind of a mechanism which allows relative motion of two machine surfaces. So technically, right, the, the piston and the liner as a, as a unit, that is what you would call a slideway right? So that's a, another kind of bearing. But we don't want to talk about those. We want to talk specifically about the ones associated with the crankcase. So that's one reason why we're saying crankcase instead of engine bearing. The other reason is because, let's say, for example, in piston compression applications, right, there are crankcases there, the bearings operate off a very similar principle, and those are not engines. Now, in some cases, you have instances where the two are combined, right? So you might have a gas engine, which is running a piston gas compressor, and they are both operating off the same crankcase, right? In which case the compression and the engine side are both being lubricated in the same way. So there's a couple of variations on this, and for the purposes of this discussion, let's call it a crankcase bearing. And the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna sort of figure out how do we build one of these crankcase bearings? Well, you've obviously got the crankcase, and there is um, kind of like a shaft that is going to go through the connecting rod. Uh, there's two bearing shells, which go either side of that. And then you've got the connecting rod and the pin. They're obviously held together by a couple of bolts and we tighten everything up. There's kind of a hierarchy here. Um, where at all possible, we want to protect the crankshaft, right? The reason we want to protect the crankshaft is because number one, it's the most expensive bit of kit out of the three uh, components here, but also it's the most difficult to replace, right? Um, and th that's one reason for making sure that we prioritize protection of the crankshaft. Then after that, we have the connecting rod, right? Connecting rod, you, you know, you've only got two other components, right? There's the bearing shell and the connecting rod. Well, you know, to, to replace uh, either of them, you roughly have to go through the same process, but obviously the connecting rods are much more expensive than the bearing shells. So we should think of the, in, in this kind of system of three different components, we should think of the bearing as the one that is going to sacrifice itself to protect the other two components. When you look in detail, look at the space between those, right? So the bearing shell is supposed to really have almost like an interference fit with the, um, the connecting rod and the pin. Um, and the lubricant is supposed to go through the bearing shell and sandwich itself between the bearing shell and the, uh, the crankshaft that is gonna be a very, very thin film of lubricant. Now, technically, it's called thick film lubrication because it's a hydrodynamic bearing, but for all intents and purposes, it's very, very small. So things like contaminants, um, whether it's soot that's produced by the engine, or maybe it's dirt that you know just simply ingresses uh, into the engine somehow, or whether it's byproducts of combustion, all of this stuff is gonna become really, really important because the tolerances and the clearances are very, very small here. Oh, sorry. Okay, so let's go. Let's go to our engine, and let's say specifically, what kind of uh, motion are we dealing with here? So if we zoom in on the particular area of interest, in this picture, the crankshaft is rotating clockwise, right? And the the if you want to say the the journal within the bearing is also rotating in a clockwise direction. So let's say, for example that we are on the power stroke, right? So we've just had a controlled explosion that has happened above, um, above the piston. And so the force is being transmitted from the piston through the connecting rod in a downward fashion. So all the pressure on, on the bearing shell is going to be on the upper half of the bearing shell, right? So that's where all of that sort of compressive force is going to be. So that is, you know, the the, uh, the the con rod pushing down on the bearing shell. And then obviously the actual journal is then pushing up against that. Now on the other side, right, the 
here the motion is still clockwise, but this time, let's say for example, it's on the compression stroke, right? So now the piston is traveling upwards. Well, all the stress is on the bottom half of the bearing shell at this point. So we can already see that one of the key kind of aspects of crank case bearing lubrication is this cyclic loading, right? It's going to load, unload, load, unload thousands and thousands of times a minute. And so that's one of the primary things that we desire out of an engine bearing is what we call fatigue strength. And when you look through the list of requirements for an engine bearing, fatigue strength kind of sits at the top, right? Because we have that cyclic loading. And when we refer to fatigue strength, there is, um, you know, different materials have different fatigue strength properties, right? So steel is generally superior to aluminium. It can take more fatigue. Um, but that, that cyclic loading is, is really important. And as we start to get into, you know, exotic alloys, they can all handle a certain amount of cyclic loading. So what we want is, is, is we desire something that can handle that constant cycling. The other thing that we want is we want a measure of seizure resistance. So let's just think about what happens to a crankcase bearing if it does seize, right? So again, clockwise motion. What happens if that bearing stops rotating in its housing? Well, you've got all this force on the power stroke, which being pushed through the connecting rod. And if you can't go anywhere, that's a really, really good way to end up with a bent connecting rod. Now, when we talk about seizure resistance, what we're really talking about is a resistance to what we call mechanical welding. And that's effectively where the, the two metal surfaces are coming into contact with each other. Maybe we've had a loss of some kind of lubricant film, or maybe it's on engine startup. We haven't had time to, to sort of prime the lubricant system. Those two metal surfaces coming into contact with each other um, are going to generate a lot of heat, and they can effectively weld, um, you know, friction weld the, the, the two materials together. And so we want resistance to that. We also want wear resistance, right? So wear comes in a number of forms. First of all, there's that kind of friction welding that we were talking about. That's a, that's a sort of a form of adhesive wear. But we also want resistance to contaminants, which can come in and cause two and three body abrasion and erosion. So that is something that we desire out of our engine bearings, because again, engines are what we call a highly contaminated environment, right? So, and that's why engine oils are so highly additized. When you look at a gas turbine oil, it's like 99% base oil, 1% additives. But because an engine oil is such a dirty environment, it's like 80 to 90% base oil and the remainder is made up by additives. So it's a, it's a highly additized product to deal with all those contaminants. Something that else that we want out of our engine bearings is that we want something which is conformable. Um, what, is it, what does that exactly mean? So when you put the two halves of the bearing shell together, they don't, they don't actually perfectly fit, right? Um, the, the, the way that they're manufactured they, they don't sit proud. Sorry, they sit a little bit proud. So they're, they're going to stick out a little bit from either the connecting rod or the pin. And when you when you put them together and then you compress everything using, using, the, screw, uh, uh, using the bolts, then what it's going to do is basically um, uh, allow that interference fit with the connecting rod and the pin um, to... Um, to, to basically form, right? It, it's forming an interference fit. And that's, that's a process which is called conformability. It also makes it a little bit resistant to a minor amount of misalignment, right? Which we might desire because obviously when we're putting engines together, sometimes we don't do it perfectly, right? So we want this, this, um, this property called conformability. One other thing that we want is corrosion resistance. So as we talked about, um, engines are quite dirty environments. There are numerous uh, sources of all kinds of different contaminants. And when we talk about the compression uh, aspect of it, maybe we're talking about you know, uh, gas compression or refrigeration compression or something like that. Now we're introducing all kinds of other contaminants that could potentially get into our crankcase. So we've got to consider all of these different aspects. You know, In an engine, which I think is the application people will be most familiar with, you get breakdown of additives can create acids. Breakdown of the base oil can, can create acids. Um, you know, contaminants in the fuel, as an example, you know, if we have uh, diesel that is, um, diesel always contains some amount of sulfur in it, even the ultra low sulfur diesel variety. But you go to other places in the world where 500 parts per million diesel is still relatively common. That sulfur is going, that elemental sulfur, you know, 
ends up in the crankcase, it forms sulfuric acid. So we have to have a measure of corrosion resistance. And then we have cavitation resistance. You might think, well, why on earth is, is cavitation happening in one of these bearings? Well, if you take an exaggerated view, right, I'm, I'm obviously greatly expanding the clearances here. The, the ID, the journal, is rotating. Uh, and it's not doing so, when it does so, it's not perfectly centered, right? Um, and in, in actual fact, it can't be centered because we are using the fact that there is this kind of fluid wedge that forms, right? The, the lubricant is being forced into this narrower and narrower gap. And that's what allows the lubricant film thickness to form. So what you'll generally find is that in one of these, um, in these bearings, the, the pressure profile as you kind of look uh, you know, around the bearing is that it slowly increases, 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 increases. And then what you see is a dramatic drop off. And that's because you can imagine that the lubricant is being formed, the, the, the lubricant film is being pushed through a narrower and narrower and, and narrower wedge, so the pressure is increasing, and then it comes out of the other side and it releases and, it dro and the pressure dramatically drops. Well, whenever we see uh, a kind of like a discontinuity in pressure, whether it's a rapid increase or a rapid decrease, then this is often a source of, of, of problems, right? When you see a rapid decrease in pressure, this is usually where you can end up with cavitation problems. And so on the backside of this bearing is where you are likely to see cavitation. One last one, which I didn't realize was an actual word, is something called embeddability, right? Now, this goes back to our initial idea that we want to preserve the crank shaft wherever possible because it is the far more expensive and more important component. So what we mean by this is, let's say, for example, we have a contaminant and it gets forced into this narrow gap, right? The lubricant film, remember, the, the ID is the crankshaft. And so what we want is for that contaminant, it, it can't go anywhere, right? Where's it going to go? So if it has to go somewhere, we want it to embed in the bearing shell. And this is the, 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 the property called embeddability. So we want that contaminant to actually dive into the bearing shell. And we want that bearing shell to kind of be like self-healing, right? So we want it to sort of form a bit of a layer over the top of that contaminant. And we want to hold it until the bearing shell gets gets um, replaced. So that's a, that's a sort of an interesting property that I had never really come across before. So anyway, so crankcase bearings, um, very, very important, but in some ways kind of sacrificial, right? So you want them to sacrifice themselves for the sake of the connecting rod and the, uh, the crankshaft.